Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning at Bethel Christian Reformed Church as we gather in God's house as his people to begin a new week as resurrected people, people who live in the light of Christ's resurrection. This morning I want to welcome all of you, if you're, especially if you're a visitor, if you've never been to this place and you look around and you see especially some young women really dressed up. This is also the Sunday where I feel underdressed. Uh, Friday was prom in one of our local Christian schools. Um, a lot of you might call what they're wearing formal wear. In Iowa, we call that a snowsuit. Um, but we're thankful that we can celebrate young and old here today. And also Unity Christian, uh, one of our local high schools, will be sending a group here to sing this Sunday evening at 6 at the Bell Conto. That music group will be leading us in worship this evening. I invite you all back to enjoy the gift and ministry of music. But as we gather in God's house this fifth Sunday of Advent, would you please with me quiet our hearts, bow our heads, and ask for God's blessing on this service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this ancient rhythm of your church where we hear again the story of our salvation written in the blood of our Savior. Father, each of us come to this place with longings, with dreams, with hungers. Lord, we ask that in this day you would fill us or that you would bend our hunger and our thirsting to you alone or that in this day we would catch a glimpse of Jesus and that your spirit would apply the work and person of Jesus to our heart and lives so that we will leave this place not just as his ambassadors, but as we walk beside him. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, would you please stand for our call to worship. This morning we will be looking at the word of Jesus from the cross, I thirst. And as we gather in God's house, we are reminded from the words of Psalm 42 of the thirst that we have. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. We join with the psalmist opening the service with a quiet song, a song that is a prayer, speaking of that longing to meet with our Savior as the deer. Let's sing these three stanzas.
come with a longing for our God and he comes to us with a word of greeting and in that greeting a promise that he will fill us. Friends, receive the greeting. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you now and forevermore. Amen. Please turn this Sunday morning and give a warm greeting to everyone around you. We continue in worship, singing a song from the Grace Altar Hymnal number 500. How firm a foundation. Last week, Sunday, we saw that because Jesus was forsaken, we will never be. This is our foundation as we worship again. Number 500, stanzas 1 through 3 and 5. Again, we begin a new week, and we begin with the gift of a time to be honest with God and one another in confession, and a gift to receive in this new day God's forgiveness. This morning, our time of confession will be bracketed and led by the hymn, Savior, Like a Shepherd, Lead Us. That is on Psalter Hymnal page, or actually it's, it's in our Psalter Hymnal, so we're going to sing it from the screen. We're going to sing the first two stanzas of that song as a lead into prayer. Then I'm going to lead in a prayer and give some space for silent prayer as we confess our sins to God. We're then going to sing stanza three. We're going to go from that into hearing God's word for our life responsively in the Psalter hymnal uh, as we read uh, page 1017, the word of God and in the law of God. And then we're going to finish our time singing stanza four, again, of Savior like a shepherd lead us. Let's do all of this as a prayer. <laughs>
laid down. God, you are the great shepherd, the one who tenderly gathers your lambs under your arms and carries us in your all-embracing love. Yet, Father, as we begin a new week and look back at the old one, we see that like sheep we have wandered from you. We have followed our own ways. We have ignored your voice. We have distrusted your care. So forgive us, Father, for our stubborn rebellion, our hardened hearts, our lack of trust. Refresh us once again by the quiet waters of your mercy. Restore our souls by your redeeming love. Guide our paths that we may follow you more closely. Even as we lay before you in silence now, our sins. Hear, Lord, these cries of our hearts and bring forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Good Shepherd. Amen. hear his word of assurance again from 1 Peter 2. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. For you like sheep are going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And With that word of forgiveness from our shepherd, he leads us in new paths of righteousness this morning through the law. Again, let's read these words responsively as a rule for gratitude, page 1017. Hear, O people of God, the law which the Lord speaks in your hearing this day, that you may know his statutes and walk according to his ordinances. Teach us, O Lord, the grace of your law, and give us life by your word. The God who saved us in Jesus Christ gave this law, saying, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. We will worship the Lord our God and serve only him. You should not make for yourself an, an image of anything to worship it. Living no more in bondage to earthly gods, we will worship the Lord our God in spirit and in truth. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord we will use the holy name of God with reverence, praising Him in everything we do and say. You shall observe the Sabbath by keeping it holy, for in six days you shall labor and do all your work. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The first part of the law is this great commandment, that we love the Lord our God with all our heart with all our mind, and with all our strength. The second part of the law is similar to the first. You shall honor your father and mother, that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. As children, we will be obedient to our parents in the Lord. As parents, we will correct our children and guide them in the training and instruction of the Lord. We will respect the lawful authorities appointed by God. You shall not murder. We will be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave us. You shall not commit adultery. We will use our bodies in ways that are holy and honorable and abstain from immorality and impurity. You shall not steal. We will do what we can for our neighbor's good and work faithfully so that we may share with the poor. Do not give false testimony against your neighbor. We will speak the truth with our neighbor in love, 
Render judgments that are true and make for peace, and not devise in our hearts any evil against anyone. Shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. We will be content, whatever the circumstances, through the strength of Christ within us. Thus we must love our neighbor as ourselves. For the Lord requires of us to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Amen. These are the paths that our Good Shepherd leads us on in a new week. Let's sing stanza four. you to turn with me into the Word of God, the Gospel of John, where Jesus said, I am the Good Shepherd. This morning we'll be in chapter 19 of that Gospel, verses 28 and 29 only. Those are on page 1005 in your pew Bibles. I invite you to open up the Bible and keep it open as we dig into this portion of Christ's Word to us. Page 1005, John 19, verse 28 and 29. This is the fifth Sunday of Lent. This is, therefore, the fifth saying of Jesus on the cross. Next week, Sunday, as Palm Sunday already, we'll be hearing the sixth word of Jesus, the final word that he speaks in the Gospel of Luke. Then Good Friday, we're going to gather here, we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper, and we're going to hear Jesus' final word from the cross as recorded in John. And then Easter morning, we're going to gather in the light of the resurrection, and from John's Gospel, we're going to hear the first word that Jesus spoke as resurrected Savior where we're going. As we move through this series, though, on these seven words, we've noted that in each of the Gospels that we've gone, there's been different recordings of different sayings and different inspired and fallible, but different perspectives on what happened. And yet, as you read all four Gospels, you'll notice that there are some striking similarities on some details you wouldn't expect. All four Gospels, for example, record that when the soldiers stripped Jesus, they gambled for his clothing. And all four also record that on the cross there was beverage service. All four record that Jesus was offered drink on the cross. But yet only John of the four Gospels records Jesus' words about that. Only John records the words of Jesus, I am thirsty. That's striking because of the four Gospels, John's typically the most abstract, the most theological, the most spiritualized. And yet he records the least spiritual thing that Jesus says from the cross. The other things are prayers, they are forming new communities, they're promising heaven, they're exactly what you would expect. But this is just naming a bodily need. I am so thirsty. And yet if you read John's Gospel, this is not by accident. At the very end of his Gospel, John said that there were so many things that Jesus said and did that if he wrote them all down, they would fill the whole world with the books that would be written. But each one of the things that he wrote was so that we would believe that every detail he chose intentionally because he believed we needed to hear it. So this morning, the question is, what is so important about Jesus saying, I am so thirsty? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to your word again. We ask that as we hear these words that you would enable us to receive them. Not as the words of a man who is preaching or the words of an old book, but as the words of you, the living God, speaking again to the hearts and minds and very being of your people. Lord, create in us a hunger for your word, a hunger for truth that only you can fill. Lord, once again, open our eyes that we may see Jesus. We ask this in his name. Amen. John 19, verse 28 and 29. 
later knowing that all was now completed, and so that the Scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it and put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to begin this morning talking about water. Water, of course, if you've studied chemistry, is a combination of two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom by a covalent bond. It's just a very simple molecule. And yet water is a pretty important part of our world. If you look from space, water covers 71% of the planet Earth. Unless Russell Crowe's involved, and then it's a little bit higher percentage. But water is everywhere. But more important to us, water is also who we are. Each one of us, for as sophisticated as we are, for as fancy as we might dress this morning, we are mostly bags of water. Scientists say that we are 60% water by weight. Someone who's around 180 pounds like me, that means that over 100 pounds of my weight is water. 13 gallons of water make up who I am, someone of my weight. We are mostly bags of water. And that's remarkable. You study that actually men are a little bit more watery than, than women. I don't know what that means. When you're young, an infant is 75% water, and then that slowly reduces by age, which my wife said maybe explains my dry humor. <laughs> water, though, is what makes us. And because water is what makes us, it is vitally important that we have it. If your water volume, that 13 gallons, reduces by just 2%, you begin to experience dehydration. Longing for water, swelling of the tongue, blistering of the lips. As you get to 5 and 10% reduced water capacity, then you get headaches and dizziness and fatigue. Eventually, you get kidney shut down. You get seizures and death. Every one of us have experienced some of these symptoms. We look at water and we remember those times when we were longing for it. That time we would look at a, a glass of water and we could give anything to drink that, to feel the cool, refreshing, to get rid of this ter terrible thirst in our throats. And water is so good. Ooh. Oh, that is good. We all know the power of thirst. And maybe that is our entrance, our point of connection to the cross this morning. Because none of us here have known what it's like to be beaten by a Roman whip. And none of us here this morning know what it's like to have a crown of thorns pressed into your scalp. And none of us have ever had stakes driven through our wrist or through our feet. And none of us have ever hung naked in the Palestinian sun. But every one of us has been thirsty. And maybe that's why in all the four Gospels, the only description of Jesus' physical suffering is not the pain of the spikes or the blister of the sun. The only description we have is that he was thirsty because that's the suffering we understand. And Jesus certainly was thirsty. If you read the Gospel accounts, his last drink was probably on the upper room, probably at the, good, the Last Supper when he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Drink this whenever you do in remembrance of me. But after he drank of that cup, he went down to the Kidron Valley, and there he prayed with sweat like drops of blood, his body losing water. Then he was suddenly arrested in the middle of the night. He went through six different trials, never with a pause to catch his breath or to get a drink. Then he was beaten severely with tremendous loss of blood. Then he was placed on a cross for three hours in the morning sun, and then three more hours in the darkness. And now after that many hours without a drink, after six hours on the cross, Jesus, at the end of his life, cries out, I am so thirsty. The Greek that he cries out actually isn't a sentence. It's one word in Greek, dipso. John is showing that Jesus, at the end of his life, is so parched, his tongue is so swollen, his throat is so dry, all he can croak out is one word, in English, it would be the word thirsty, thirsty. 
And it's in that moment of physical suffering that Jesus, on the physical side, experiences what hell is. You notice in Luke 16, when hell is described as the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, notice what's the suffering. Father Abraham, says the rich man, have pity on me, send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. The terror of hell is not the blisters of the fire. It is the eternal and unquenchable thirst. And that's where Jesus was at the end of his life. Now the other sayings on the cross that we've heard of Jesus are exactly the things we would expect the God-man Jesus to say. They are prayers, Father, forgive. They are words of grace, you'll be with me in paradise. They are words forming a faith community, a new family. They are even the words of last week's Sunday, this Trinitarian dialogue of the Son speaking to the Father through the inspired spirit words of Scripture. That's what we would expect Jesus to say. But this fifth word is not so spiritual. This is Jesus at his most human and his most vulnerable. The Gospel of John makes a lot about the deity of Jesus. And so throughout this Gospel, he takes up the language of Exodus 3, where God said his name is, I am that I am. And seven times in John's Gospel, he takes that phrase, I am, applies it to Jesus. So Jesus says, I am the, the good shepherd, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the gate, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection life, I am the way, the truth, and life, I am the true vine. Each of those seven I am's show his divinity. But then at the end, Jesus shows not his divinity, but his humanity. I am thirsty. This is Jesus using the same body, living as a human being who's 60% water, just like you and like me. The question is, what do we do with that word? What do we do with this humanity of Jesus? Why is John, at the end of his gospel, drawing us back to the very beginning of the gospel? John 1.14, when he said, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Why, after showing us that this fleshy word walked with us and ate with us and wept with us, why at the end is it so important that we see that that flesh was beaten and mocked and crucified and that that flesh thirsted? I want to suggest that there are three things in this little detail that John wants us to see so that we would believe. And the first of those things this morning is simply this, that Jesus understands our weakness. I'm not a parent. I have no pretending to, to know what it would be like to be a mother. But I know that many mothers nowadays are weaning their children older. They're breastfeeding for longer and longer. That was even the cover of Time magazine uh, recently. I overheard a story of a mother in this community who's trying now to wean their toddler off that. And so the toddler in the middle of the night, not understanding what's going on, was in her crib crying out, I'm so thirsty, Mama. I'm so thirsty, Mama. Saying in words what infants say in crying, the very first impulse that we humans have, right from the birth moment, humans come into this world thirsty. And if you've ever walked with someone when they've died, if any of us have ever walked with a loved one or someone through the last stages of death, as our body shuts down, we begin to get dehydrated. And in moments of energy or consciousness, one of the things I've heard frequently as a chaplain, as a pastor, is the dying person say, could you give me some water? I'm so thirsty. From the very first moments of life to the very end, this experience of thirst defines what it is to live in this world as a 60% bag of water. And Jesus on the cross shows us what he has lived all through his life, that every daily suffering that it is to be a human being, even that suffering of, of wanting to have a drink and not being able to get it, that Jesus understands that weakness. That one day every one of us will die, and likely many of us will be thirsty in those closing moments when I talk to people who are dying. 
Most often they're not afraid of death. They know heaven's there. What they're afraid of is the dying, the sensations of it. And Jesus has been through that for us too. He understands exactly what we're going through. Which is why we read in Hebrews 2, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who was the power of death and free those who all their lives are held in slavery by the fear of death. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way, so that he would be a merciful high priest. When we think of Jesus so often, we think of him as divine, second person of the Trinity, God incarnate, powerful, creator of heaven and earth. And he is, but he's also human. And he understands everything you're going through. Are you teased at school? He was mocked. Do you feel God is distant? He was forsaken. Do you have chronic pain? He was in absolute pain. Are you thirsty this morning as I'm talking? He was too. He understands. The first thing we need to see from this detail, I am so thirsty. But John wants us to see something deeper than that. Do you notice when he gives this word, John frames it in a certain way in verse 28. The way he frames it is this. So that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. He was physically thirsty, but he said it conscious of scripture as well. What John is showing us there, firstly, is that even in the midst of suffering and pain, God is in control. That four times in John 19, we find that phrase, so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Four times in this one chapter. John wants us to know that Jesus' death on the cross was not an accident. It did not surprise God. That God sovereignly was bending all things, even the, the dividing of his garments, even the thirst of his son, so that his scripture would be fulfilled. This shows God's sovereignty his purpose even in suffering. The scriptures that Jesus would have been speaking of were Psalm 22, the one that we've already seen quoted from the cross. Psalm 22, 15, My strength is dried up like a pot shard. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. And then also Psalm 69, They put gall in my food and give me vinegar for my thirst. Jesus on the cross is thirsty. He is also aware of Scripture. In his dying moments, in the midst of agony, what comes to his heart is Scripture. I want you to think about that this morning. Jesus is 100% divine, but he is also 100% human. In Philippians 2, we're told that he emptied himself of his humanity. He didn't try to grab, grab hold of his divine power, but he became obedient to human power even unto death on a cross. Theologians say that what Jesus is doing in Philippians 2, he is not giving up his divine nature, but he's given up his divine prerogative. That as he lived this life, he lived with the same power that you and I do. He didn't just, even though he could make the ocean with his power, he didn't make some water in his throat to cool his thirst. He needed to drink with a cup just like you and I. Jesus, that's why he said in John 14, verse 12, Look, you think what I'm doing is good? You can do the same thing. Because I'm doing these miracles not as God, I'm doing them as a man who has faith in God, leaning on God's power, not the power that I have because I've emptied that. That means if Jesus is truly vulnerable and weak like us, and yet he can do what he does, it's because of power we have available, and that power is Scripture. pastor who was very helpful as I've thought through this, a pastor named Renee, points out with Tim Keller that when we are stressed, when the world crushes in on us, when we are backed into a corner, when everything is pulling us down, what comes out of us in those moments is our deepest and truest self. What comes out of us in moments of terrible stress is who we really are, whether that's anger or bitterness or something else. And on the cross, what we see coming out of Jesus is what has always come out of him, his strength, scripture. 
the beginning of his life when he was 12 years old, Jesus was in the temple. And what was he doing? He was debating with the teachers of the law, and they were amazed at how much this boy understood Scripture. It's the beginning of his ministry when Jesus was tempted. Three times Satan comes to him with temptation. Three times Jesus answers, it is written. He answers with Scripture. When Jesus debated the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, he said, you are in error because you do not know the power of God or the Scriptures. Again and again, throughout the Gospels, Jesus is quoting Scripture, living Scripture, pointing to Scripture, fulfilling consciously the Scripture. And so it's no surprise on the cross in his worst moment when he is pinned down that what comes out of him is Scripture. The prayer of Psalm 22 last week and an awareness of Psalm 22 even as he understands his own thirst. So friends, if we realize that Jesus shares our weakness, then we also need to realize the source of his strength, and that is Scripture. And if you want to say, I really like Jesus, I really like the kind of love ethic that he taught, but I don't really like these Scriptures. They're a little old-fashioned, they're a little judgmental, they're a little complex. Give me Jesus and not Scripture. You have maybe a Jesus of your creation, but you don't have the Jesus of the Bible, because that Jesus, when you pinned him to a cross, bled the scriptures. I read this week an uh, evangelical young blogger reacting to the, the fluff after the world vision reversal of their policy change on marriage. And she was saying, well, I really love Jesus, but I can't stand the evangelical church and their judgmentalism, all the ways they cling to all these old things. I just want to have Jesus and wash feet. I don't want to deal with this. You don't have Jesus unless you deal with this. Because this is Jesus' source of power. This is what he leans on. This is what sustained him in life and in death. So Jesus understands our weakness. Jesus points us to the source of his strength. And then in closing, one final thing. There's deep irony in John's gospel at the end because Jesus has throughout his life spoken of thirst. We're going to look next week, Sunday evening, at John chapter 4 in our sermon, but John records Jesus speaking to the woman at the well, and what he says to her is this, everyone who drinks the water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. It will be a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus promised that if you live with him, you won't thirst. John 7 says a similar thing. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. So Jesus, throughout his ministry, on different occasions, says, I am the source of water. I am the living water. If you are in me, you will never thirst again. Water will come from me to you. And yet, ironically, at the end, John's the one who records that this giver of water is thirsty. What is going on? Well, John recorded another detail that's not in any of the other Gospels. In Matthew and in Mark, when they give Jesus the drink, they say they put it on a branch. But John, verse 29, names what kind of plant that branch was. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked it in a sponge and put the sponge on a stalk of, John adds, hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. Now, if every detail John wrote was for a purpose, why did he name the species of branch that was used? John did that because he knew Scripture. And he knew what was written in Exodus chapter 12, verse 22, slaughter the Passover lamb, take a branch of hyssop, dip it in the blood of the basin, and put some blood on the top and on both sides of the doorframe. And standing under the cross, in the cry of thirst, with that hyssop branch, John saw what Jesus had been talking about throughout his life. That at Passover, the Passover lamb had to die so that the people of God could live. And in that moment under the cross, John realized that Jesus had to thirst so that we could be filled 
with the living water. That the only way that we could have streams of water and never thirst again was because Jesus thirsted. He experienced that hell for us. In the words of Fleming Rutledge, this is the profound thing that was happening. The one who gives the calm of lakes and pools, the freshness of brooks and streams, the majestic depths of seas and oceans, the glory of pounding surf, the might of Niagara and the twinkle of the garden fountain, the one who's, from whose being flows the gift of the water of eternal life, this is the one who is dying of a terrible thirst on the cross for the love of his lost. That's why John includes the detail. So what's this all mean for us? What do we do with the fact that Jesus was thirsty, therefore showing us he understands, pointing us to the source of his strength, and reminding us of how he is our living water? What's that mean for us? Two things. First, it means that this morning, Jesus is inviting all of us to come and to receive his gift. Jesus was thirsty, friends, that none of us have to leave this place with that thirst. Jesus is pointing us back to Isaiah 55, verse 1. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, you who have no money, come buy and eat. By the free grace of what he did on the cross, we can leave this place with that thirst for purpose and meaning and fellowship filled in the one who is the only one who can fill us. Jesus points ahead also to Revelation 22. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come and let him who hears come. Whoever is thirsty, let them come. And whoever wishes, let them take of the free gift of the water of life. If you have never trusted this Jesus, but you feel in the weakness and in the pain and the suffering of life a thirst for something more, for someone more, this is the morning when Jesus says, Come and drink. You don't need to thirst. I've done that for you. The second thing this means, though, if we have already done that, if we have experienced Jesus and his filling of life-giving water in our soul, then what do we do? Jesus invites us to share that gift with others. You know, there was someone in John's Gospel, someone who stood under the cross, we don't know who, who heard Jesus say that one word in Greek, dipso, thirsty, and one person had the pr privilege of finding a jar of wine vinegar and dipping a sponge and putting it on the stalk of hyssop and giving it to Jesus, and someone for the rest of their life could say, I gave Jesus a drink of water. At the end of his life, when he was thirsty, I was the one who got to give him something to drink. Maybe we wish we could do that too. Maybe we wish we would be able to say that we gave Jesus something to drink. But of course we can. Matthew 25, Jesus says this, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. Whatever you do for one of the least of these, you do for me. Friends, if you have life-giving water flowing within you, it can't stay in you. It has to flow out through you. It has to flow out to a world that's still thirsty, that still needs to hear that call of God, come to the water, you who have no money, receive the gift, the gracious gift of the water of life. Did you know that Mother Teresa's life verse was John 19, verse 28? Her life verse was this phrase of Jesus, this fifth saying of the cross, I am thirsty. And so wherever her sisters of charity went in the world when they built houses to help feed the poor, and every one of those, the one thing that's common throughout all of the world is every one of them has a crucifix of Jesus with the verse from John 19, 28, I thirst. Because in giving a cup of cold water to the poor and the hurting and the marginalized, we are, by grace, giving water to Christ himself. So friends, go into this week as bearers of living water as God flows his love through you to others. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that so many of the things Jesus spoke on the cross were about others. 
that his first word from the cross was that you would forgive the very ones who were hurting him. That his second word was a promise of grace to a fellow thief. That his next word was the forming of this fellowship that we call the church. And yet, Lord, we thank you in this fifth word. This one example of Jesus referring to his own weakness and need and vulnerability. And yet, we thank you that in this detail we catch a glimpse of your great love for us. Heavenly Father, we pray that any of us who are thirsty this morning, who have never known you, that this would be the morning when we drink deeply of the cup of your grace. And you move us to heed that invitation to come, all who are thirsty, come to the water. Heavenly Father, those of us who by grace have drunken deeply of this living water, we pray that in this week you would move us to give this water to others. That you would quench the thirst of this world through the grace and mercy that you give to your church. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people say, Amen. Our song of response is an old hymn of the church that speaks of this suffering of our Savior on our behalf. Ah, holy Jesus. We'll sing stanzas one through three. Would you please stand? come to this risen Savior who knows our weakness, who is a merciful high priest, and now intercedes for us. Let's bring him our prayers. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that because the Passover lamb died, your people could live, that through the blood spread by a hyssop branch on the tops and sides of a doorframe, that that doorway that would be to death now becomes a doorway to life into the promised land. And we thank you that Jesus is our Passover lamb. That by the blood that flowed from his scalp and from his hands, that he has become for us a door. So that even the death that we fear is no longer a doorway to destruction, but a doorway to life into the promised land, to eternity with you. Lord, we thank you that one of your descriptions of heaven is that in that place there will be no more thirst. We would truly experience your life-giving water flowing through us, refreshing us, filling us always. 
Lord, even in a broken world, we thank you for this life-giving water that already flows. Father, once again, we pray that no one would leave this place without drinking deeply of the river of your grace. And we thank you that your offer comes to us by radio and internet, by television. Lord, in so many ways, your word goes out in this world and with every proclamation of your gospel, always this invitation to come, you who have no money. Lord, thank you for your grace. Heavenly Father, thank you also for the way that this grace gives us our purpose in this world. Lord, thank you that with living water flowing within us, we cannot be a pool that contains it. We must also be rivers. Thank you for the opportunities in this new week for your grace to flow not just to us, but through us. Lord, thank you for the callings that you've given some to be doctors and nurses, to be EMTs, to be those firefighters, people in moments of crisis and pain, to bring in those moments your life-giving water, the presence and comfort of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for those of us called to broad kingdom service in business and in agriculture, in teaching, in raising children, in all the different walks of life, that in every one of these ways you provide opportunities to give a cup of cold water to the least of these. We pray that in this week you would move your church to mercy, that you would move us to sacrificial service, not just as a congregation, Lord, but as your body around this world. So, Lord, we do pray for the churches of this community this morning. We do especially pray for Hope Lutheran Church. We pray that you would bless the ministry of these sisters and brothers, that they would bring a cup of cold water, that the world, through their ministry and worship and service, would know Jesus. Heavenly Father, we pray too for the missionaries who go out from this place, who sometimes in very real ways are meeting the hunger and thirst of the least of these. But we thank you again for the Farmer to Farmer program and the way that through partnership of your body here with body in Nicaragua, you are building farms and through farms, wells, and through these things, the chance for people to taste and to see that you are good. Lord, we thank you with Josh and Joni Garcia for the work that you're doing through them. We pray your blessing on the library project that they've been spearheading with the Nicaraguan Christian Academy. Bless that project as well. Lord, we thank you with Vasya and Miranda and Natan as they work in Ukraine, a nation now torn by so many conflicts where so many people are thirsting for something different, something better. That You have placed them there with a cup of cold water of your gospel, but also, Lord, with a home that is open to orphans, the children from troubled families, that in the meals that they share with these young children through this week, that they are giving water to you. Father, we thank you as a church that you are a God who also knows our weakness through Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would walk beside those who are suffering and hurting. And we pray for each couple in this church who is seeking to have children. We pray that you would give your patience, your peace, and your miracle. Lord, we thank you also for those who are walking the road of adoption. We praise you with Grant and Ronnie for the progress in their adoption process. We thank you with Wade and Denise Vandenberg as they wait for their child to come home this summer. Lord, as other couples and families from this church are also going through this adoption journey, may you walk beside them as the good shepherd. Lord, may these children of your choosing, you have ordained to join our family here at Bethel, be protected, be guarded, and may you bring them home soon. Heavenly Father, we pray this day, too, for those who know the suffering of the cross, of being on the receiving end of mockery, those who feel forsaken by friends, by family, even by you. Lord, we thank you that in Jesus' thirst, in his vulnerability, in his humanity, we are pointed to his understanding of our weakness, but also his strength. Father, we pray that each of us, in whatever season of life we are in, would find in the life-giving water of Scripture, our hope, Lord, that you would form in us a love of Scripture, a respect and reverence for it. Lord, that you would stir those of us who aren't doing devotions to, in this week, experience the life-giving water of Scripture flowing, washing over us every day, so that you would build this into us, that in moments of pain and stress and longing and fear, when the world pierces us, what we bleed also is the truth of your word. Heavenly Father, this week we do thank you for your work among us. 
We thank you with Rodney Bokema for a return home. We pray now your blessing on the therapy that he received, that you would guard his life, give him full recovery and strength. Heavenly Father, we thank you with Eileen and Boris for a good report on Friday. There is no more cancer in her cheek. Bless now the recovery from her surgery, but we thank you, Lord, for this good news. Lord, with Corwin and Harriet and their family, we also thank you for a good report for their daughter, Sherry Dezea. We thank you that her body is free of cancer. Even as she now continues her treatments, may you bless her and give her the strength that she needs. But Lord, in these moments of your faithfulness, may we give you praise. We thank you also with Gary and Cynthia Cried for a good surgery and now encouraging results for their granddaughter, Amanda. We pray that as she is restored to her home early next week, that you would watch over her recovery. Lord, we just thank you that in each of these situations, we have experienced you hearing our prayer being our healer. And in that hope, Lord, we continue to lift up Ed Zomerman to you. We pray that you would shepherd him through the remainder of this cycle of radiation treatments. May you remove cancer from his body. We pray already for a good report, Lord, when the next PET scan is, is held. Father, we continue to lift up Salon Cam. We pray that you would give good results for the biopsy that she just experienced, that you also would give her a release from the pain that she's experiencing in her back, that you would guard her life. Lord, that she would know in her weakness her Savior Jesus walking with her. We pray for Sean Friends that you also would give clarity about what's going on in his body, that you would bless the, the test that he's received and any treatments that you will give. Continue to lift and walk beside Faith Franken and Jan Hoagland as these daughters walk beside you, their good shepherd, through the valley of the shadow of death. Surround them and their family with your light, with your love, with your presence. Heavenly Father, we continue to lift up those who struggle with depression and anxiety, with deep loneliness, whether we are married or single. Lord, we pray for reconciliation of each strained relationship between parent and child, between spouses, between friends. Lord, may we forgive as we've been forgiven. Heavenly Father, we do pray that as we give you our gifts and our offerings, as you use them in this community and in this broken world, we pray that you would give a cup of cold water through your church. We pray that you would shape a new generation of believers to drink deeply of this water and to be fountains of living water to others. We pray that you would do these things through your grace. We ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people again say, Amen. Our offering is first for the ministry of this church and the Christian Reformed Church around the world. The second is for Christian education. As we give our gifts and our offerings, we will hear a song that speaks of the beautiful, terrible cross where Jesus has, in his death and resurrection, thirsted for us so that the world would now be filled with him. Okay. 
Jesus, you paid the horrible cost. We stand forgiven and praise you for the beautiful, terrible cross. For the beautiful, terrible cross. Terrible cross. beautiful, terrible cross, we have our thirst quenched and we go into a world to be God's vessels in this week. Our closing song will be Psalter Hymnal 560, Like a River Glorious. We'll sing stanza one, receive God's blessing, and sing stanza two as our doxology. Please stand as the music begins. go into this day with God's blessing and again invite you back at six tonight to receive more ministry and music through the night sound uh, through community choir as we praise God beginning at the end of the day with this blessing the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace and be your source of eternal water in Jesus name amen <laughs> Thank you.